alive. I guess we should do this the right way and um, open in prayer. God, thank you for um, the sunshine that we're getting today, even if we are getting some wind. Um, it's such a spring gets to be such a nice time of the year. We're just looking forward, seeing all the trees budding. And Lord, it um, for me it makes me look forward to uh, paradise in heaven with you, and that's what that's what uh, my heart is really set on, God. And uh, this world, day by day, is getting worse and worse, and makes me long for our, um, our real home all the more. God, we pray that you bless this study tonight and um, help us to see some insights into your word. Grant us wisdom, we pray. And uh, Lord, may we all be blessed in uh, the study of your word. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, we're back in Revelation again. We are back in Revelation again. For a minute. Still. Uh, we we didn't quite finish all of the uh, 144,000 stuff. There's there's still some more stuff to explore. So, um, and there's some other events that go on. I kind of threw into to this outline here. Um, again, let me do this this way here. So, just by way of review, the, the first five chapters we went through are, are all pre-tribulation. And then the very first thing that happens is the scroll judgments. And remember this, this is the heptatic stru structure, which means it's groups of sevens. So... A couple of things I moved around. One of them was um, the parenthetic seven, where it is. It looks like it could happen before um, the sixth seal. Any time from uh, in between there to the to the you know fifth seal and forward, it could happen, but. Part of the language we see is that it's going to be, um, you know, do not harm the trees, do not harm the sea, all that kind of stuff, until the 144,000 are sealed, basically what it is. So um, I kind of moved it up to there, but it could happen any time before that. So we're going to see some of that happening with the trumpet judgments, though, um, getting up into Chapter 8. So between the 6th and 7th seal is the, the parenthetic that we've already covered. Do you remember what that is? What was going on? Yes, you have to actually look in your Bibles. and <laughs> No skating around here. So the hundred in chapter seven, 144. 144,000. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a look at that some more. Trick question and Debbie got it. <laughs> so we're going to look at. Uh, too obvious. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, know. <laughs> I thought it was. So we get the, the. The trumpets, but then I added these in here. Now, this is interesting that you'll start reading as you go. Um, you'll find some woes, three woes. We mentioned the woes before, but this is kind of roughly where they, where they fall. There's the first woe, and all the woes seem to be demonic-type satanic activity that are poured upon the earth. I mean, directly, obviously. You're going to have demon-possessed people anyway. You're going to have those kinds of things going on. But the woes are really significant, like Apollyon opening the pit in the ground and letting these uh, demonic creatures loose upon the world. And then right away in uh, the seventh trumpet, we have another woe that happens right around there. And then you get into chapter 12 is 
really it's a woe as well. So you'll notice that when you get in there. And then we have the seventh trumpet is the bowls, and that begins chapter 16, and they kind of hit rapid fire. Um, chapters 14, 15, as we get closer, you might want to start reading those. A lot of those, um, they are the great tribulation, the second half of the tribulation, but they're all kind of parenthetic to each other. In other words, you're going to see the... Um, Babylons, the two Babylons, and some activity there. You're going to see um, the armies gathering together and getting ready for, because it takes a while to stage an army, getting ready for Armageddon. You're going to see some stuff going on in heaven. You're going to see chapter 14. You're going to see the 144,000 again. So what you see with the woes is uh, Apollyon releases the demonic creatures, and that happens in chapter 9. Um, and then you have the fifth trumpet, which are these little beastie things that are kind of like grasshoppers, but they have stings like scorpions and, and, uh, supposed to be really painful. And then the sixth trumpet is a demonic horde that comes that are bigger life-size type that look at first blush like they're on horseback, but you look at them and those aren't quite horses. And the descriptions are they were partly wearing army, so there's these demonic creatures riding these demonic horse type creatures so it sounds like something out of you know Lord of the Rings or something really crazy um, and then you have the parenthetical that happens no more delay great tribulation starts and that the seventh trumpet will herald the bowls in, in um, chapter chapter 10 with an announcement a big announcement that happens so how that happens um, after 1260 days of the two witnesses ministries uh, of the two witnesses ministry they're killed after three and a half days they arise and then the second woe begins um, the seventh trumpet with a quake destroying a tenth of the city and it kills 7,000 and then the seventh trumpet heralds the seven bold judgments and then you end up with the third woe up in chapter 12 and that's the wrath of wrath of Satan that's for Satan's been kicked down to the to the earth and um, Satan's given permission by God to um, torment the Saints on the earth at the time now that's different from the church age what did Jesus say about the Saints during the church age that we live in now with um, concerning Satan's power and authority he has to, yeah. We don't, we're not under wrath. We're not under wrath. And what about in Matthew? Remember he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. During the tribulation period, the gates of hell will prevail. Interesting thought about that. Mm -hmm. Gates are a defensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not an offensive yeah. weapon. That's right. You never see an army charging into battle with gates. <laughs> <laughs> so... Unless it's her last name. <laughs> um, so God releases Satan as judgment upon the nations and the um, beast systems of Babylon. The, the woman in Revelation chapter 12, Israel, is protected for the next 1260 days, we're told. And that's chapter 12, verse 6. Or three and a half years. It's put as 1260 days in verse 6, and in the same chapter, verse 14, it's mentioned as um, three and a half years. So, and then toward the very end, that's where we get the, um, the second coming and the grapes of wrath. That's where judgment upon the world comes to its final culmination at the very end of the bowls. And um, it's, it, finally, Christ will come and establish his, uh, his kingdom after the sheep and goats judgment. So we got that far. Um, what else want to look at moving ahead here? So just to look at these verses again at the chapter. 
After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, um, on the sea, on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, this is what we, we didn't really um, get much into, but that's the nature of, of, these, uh, of the seals and on their forehead. Um, what are we told in the scriptures, remember, about the saints being sealed? Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Sealed, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit now. Not on our foreheads, right? But we're actually sealed. We read, and, and this, is, this is one of the things that's important for us to look at when we're looking at Bible prophecy and so forth, is that the differences between Israel and the church. I know it's popular today for a lot of people to think that the church has completed Israel or that their church and Israel are the same thing, but we see in the Old Testament quite regularly, we see the wrath of God and we see the wrath of God on the world and on Israel and around Israel and it's just wrath, wrath, wrath everywhere you read in the Old Testament. You get in the New Testament, you don't, you don't really get that. Um, concerning the church at all, you don't get it because it says that we're not appointed to wrath, so we're the bride of Christ. There's a lot of differences there. So we see wrath happen like that in, in the Exodus, and um, it's kind of hard to relate to. And But we're kind of a different construct, too, in that the church... Every member of the true church, the body of Christ, is indwelt, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And we're all God's people by virtue of we're all indwelt by a very God himself, right? In the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people, but they weren't all believers. They were God's chosen people chosen for what? Be a witness to the world. Be a witness to the world. They're also going to be the line of the Messiah, that the Lord is going to bring his Messiah to the earth through um, Israel. So they were chosen, but that doesn't make them all believers. Some people are, you know, some pots are chosen for dishonor and some are for honor, right? So those are a lot of differences. So it's important to look at the differences as well as the similarities when you're looking at, at some of those. So here, seals similar because um, I want us to take up, this is really a key passage. We, we look at, at the, the seals on the foreheads of um, the 144,000. Mm -hmm. So Ezekiel 9, in case you didn't know by looking at that up there in the upper left-hand corner. Um, look, don't know. When the last time was you? You read through old Zeke there, but um, you know, like two weeks ago, I finished. You did, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of wickedness going on in Israel at the time, a, a lot of idol worship. We saw some of that last week, some of the idol worship that was going on. And that's why we had lost a couple of, a couple of tribes, and in the listing, in the twelfth thousand from each tribe for the hundred forty four thousand so starting in verse three now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple and he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side and the Lord said to him go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the man who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said, in, in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eye spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old 
and young men, maidens, and little children, and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. Another horrific and an amazing thing. So here they, these were marked. Now, these could have been marked with something that the angels themselves could see, right? I don't know if it's anything physical that human to human that they would see on each other. So it's uh, difficult to tell from the passage there to me unless you see something I don't see, but you know, it was ink that maybe only the angels themselves could see. <laughs> Who knows? It's not going to be the invisible cross that only other believers can see like and left behind. Them. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, it is interesting, and we're going to get into to some of that here. Um, well, let's look at let's look at some of the other forehead type markings. Let's go ahead and take a look. Jump from there to Revelation chapter nine, and and let's look at some of those and see. No, I don't. I don't think it would be a cross. Well, God has done some funny things with crosses in the Old Testament, you know, like with the layout of the camp and so forth. That's kind of mm -hmm. interesting. Revelation 9, verse 3 to 5. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those, those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of, scorpion, of a scorpion when it strikes a man. So it, maybe it's the nature of the beings themselves or God gave them special ability to be able to see, but... Um, apparently, believers will have some kind of a mark that angel angelic beings will see, but also demonic beings will see. Um, we also see, but let's let's go back again real quick. Just flip a page back or two, since we have the verse down. Chapter seven. Um, verse 3 saying do not harm the earth the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads so that's chapter 3 and then chapter 14 is, is the same thing the ones who were sealed it's going to be the 144,000 in chapter 14 behold on Mount Zion stood the lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name. So they had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now it is interesting, I think, this, that in Hebrew, Yeshua and Yahweh both begin with Yod, that character that you see right there. Um, so it's just a thought. It's just speculation, but I think it's fascinating that, that it's his name and his father's name. One is Yahweh and one is Yeshua. And um, they both begin with the Yod. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be a big giant, something really prominent. We don't know how big, how tiny it is, who can see it, who can't see it, or whatever. But demonic creatures aren't allowed to um, harm anybody who's got that. So it's fascinating. So it's just the 144,000, not, not the other people that have... And it starts off with the 144,000 in chapter 9. It seems to read like all the tribulation saints. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like everybody gets it. So when you get in and start reading, it's, it talks about the saints. and So that's interesting because it's a different group. Because you have the... 144,000 in chapter 7, in chapter 9, you got 
something different going on. So something to look at and, and explore. Okay, then, as Satan likes to do, we know Satan's the big counterfeiter, right? And that's what Antichrist is, is he's the big counterfeiter. He's um, the pseudo-Christ, the Antichrist. So he's going to have this counterfeit as well in chapter 13. Let's get, I want to get all these marks. There's so much misinformation, bad information, confusion about the mark of the beast and stuff. So I, I just want to look at these and compare these and see what's going on. Chapter 13, 16 to, let's look at, well. Oh, let's see. Well, if you go chapter 13, verse 13, he starts off with, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by these signs, which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Now, notice it was granted. He can't do these things on his own. The Holy Spirit or the Lord himself, God gives him power to um, do these things. He can't do them on his own, so it's uh, he has to get permission in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the beast, mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here's wisdom, let him understand, has understanding, calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Much has been written, speculated on about that. There are recently turned up older manuscripts than this manuscript here that gives the number of the beast is 616. So that's fascinating. So all this time people are speculating, look at this number here. If we do this, it comes out to mean this. If it, if it really is kind of a misreading of the number, and the number is really 616, isn't it? What area code is that? <laughs> That's my like birthday, June 16th. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, okay. you know, 616 is the number of the beast. You know what 668 is? The next door neighbor. The next door neighbor of the beast. Yeah, let's cross the street. <laughs> no, it would be next door. No, 667 is across the street. So you're saying the number of the beast could be 616? Yep. Yeah. The Apparently, have not that we have to look for it or whatever. It's just something that it's just yeah. people will be confused and confounded here during the. Be gone by then. Yeah. yeah. So, if something were to come on on the scene with the number somehow meaning something, whatever it means, as being six one six, and people say, no, 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 the number is six one six. That's six, six six is uh, the number of the beast is supposed to be six six six. That's six one six. That can't be it. And so they'll just be all the more deceived, right? So the older manuscripts have 616? Yeah. I wonder how it got to 666. Well, you know, it um, um, was transposed maybe incorrectly with some of the manuscripts. Okay. Um, I just think of our number, 6 and a 1, are so completely different. Yeah. But well, I forget it wouldn't be our number. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not ours at all. It's something completely different. Um, but I don't know. I would have to look into that that more because we in our English translations obviously don't have the number written down like that. We have like 603 score and six is the way they transpose the number that I guess they're used as probably actual written down numbers, I guess, in the original manuscript. So fun times. That's something to explore in your spare time. Just be careful of the YouTube videos out there. The, um, so flip out, flip forward to chapter 14, and let's look at the, the mark of the beast, because um, the thing with the mark of the beast that 
there's been some criticism and confusion on and so forth, all kinds of accusations and so forth. Is it the mark that will that will kill you and doom you to hell? Well, in a manner of speaking, um, it is because to go and get that mark, before you get the mark, you have to worship the beast. So the mark itself is just a mark. You know, you can go and get a tattoo, you can put whatever. You could write on your hand 666 right now or put it on your forehead right now. It's not necessarily going to send you straight to hell because it probably, well, for one thing, it doesn't look like the same mark that's going to come from um, the, during the time of the tribulation that comes from the beast system. And um, so that is also the reason why shots, vaccinations, a UPC barcode, um, all the things that people are are saying are the mark of the beast, aren't the mark of the beast right now. Because there's no beast. There's no beast, for one thing. So you cannot get the mark of the beast right now because it's the mark of the beast. <laughs> and that doesn't happen until the middle of the tribulation. What is the shortest amount of time we are from now to the middle of the tribulation? Three, Three and a half years at the soonest. I mean, that's if we're raptured right now and then, and if the tribulation started right away and then it's so we're, we'll never see the mark of the beast we'll may see a mark that he might end up incorporating and modifying in some way that we can't see it so chapter 14 9 to let's see 9 to 12 somewhere around there then a third angel followed them saying with uh, a, a loud voice if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead on his hand he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God again wrath of God is that for us the church right now mm -mm. no so there's not going to be a mark that we have to worry about ever as the church which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So it's the worship of the beast and his image that condemns. The so mark itself is just a mark. It could be just a tattoo of some kind that says something. It could be a chip, I guess. It could be a microchip. chip. It could be some something that's injected into the skin underneath the skin it could be a whole bunch of different things but it doesn't matter if somebody holds you down on the ground puts their knee on your chest and engraves the mark on you and you are a tribulation saint in the middle of the tribulation you are not going to hell and that was i think that was the the thing that MacArthur said that everyone's like, look, he says if you get the mark of the beast, you won't want it. And that's the, he, you know, years ago, they keep bringing it up. But that was his point. Is the mark isn't magical. Yeah. The mark is... is it's just willing to accept it and worship. And worship. Beast. Right. You're going after it. You're saying, okay, I realize this is, you know, um, a profane thing to do against the Lord and to go worship the beast instead of God. But I'm going to do it anyway because I want my stuff. And I like to, sh I want to shop. I'm tired of all the stuff that's happened, been going on since 2020 with all the masking. And I can't go to the store, I can't get on a bus, and I can't get an airplane ticket unless I'm, I've got a shot of some kind. And I'm not going to go through that again. Just go and get the mark. Just do it. Well, yeah, but you got to worship. The, yeah, so what? I'm tired of this. I'm done with it. I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and bow, worship, worship the beast, his image, whatever, and get whatever mark. That's what condemns you. It's the worship. It's false, I idol, first, false more, idols. More of that, then we think there's more. But people aren't going to be like, oh, he's so awesome. There'll be more. But it's going to be more just that worship of themselves. I want what I want. And so, sure, I'll do whatever. Sure. I'll that's, mark, I'll get but, whatever I want. But that's self-worship. That's so yeah. idolatry, right? Well, I agree. But I'm just yeah. saying, in, in, I think in, in the past, or in some people's mind, they're going to be in love with the beast. I mean, they might be in awe or whatever. But. Well, that that's... And that's something that, yeah, that that's something that you know it's portrayed in books and in movies a lot. We've seen that where you see people with their hands up and they're going, "Oh, the beast, he's so wonderful," and that's not necessarily going to be like that. It might just be people caving, just people giving in because they don't want to have to 
Get try to there. work for trade for their food or whatever they've got to do or I got to give my lawnmower up so I can get you know another couple months worth of food to feed my family. They don't want to deal with that anymore. So it's not. Nah, 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 I'll just go down. I'll just go down and do it because I can't buy sell trade. I can't do anything unless I go ahead and do it. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. And the world's going to be an ugly place. It's so bad anyway. You know they're going to just cave and give in. But a true believer won't do that. And that's that's the whole point. Well, I think it, it's, you know, obviously <laughs> the vaccine isn't going to work. But, I mean, you see that with the vaccine, there's some people that think the vaccine is great. And then there's some people who are like, well, I guess I'll just get it so that I can do my job or, you know. Do Sharply it. divided, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have actually a question about the future, though. Yeah. I'm always asking because everyone keeps on giving me their opinions, but I know I'm confused. But you know how they say in the future the Roman Empire will return and all that stuff. In what way will it return? Just will the world be united, or is it just mentioning the EU because you know the right. EU basically it's equivalent to it? Or? Yeah, that, that's a that's a couple chapters ahead, but we're not going to go back to wearing togas. <laughs> and, uh, like and carrying spears and then getting chariots and stuff and like that. Although like, I would take a chariot. Country, what country would be? Well, what, it was, what it's going to be is people dispute and, and argue frequently over that and what the Babylonian system looked like and the Tin Nation Confederacy and all that. But uh, let's keep in mind one key thing about all of this, whether it's Babylon or uh, the rise again of the Roman Empire, which we get from Daniel's statue, is that those future systems are worldwide. So the old Roman Empire, the resurrection of the Roman Empire, it might actually be in old territory, and that's where the headquarters are, but these systems are going to be global in the future. The Antichrist system, whether it's like Daniel's statue, where... Um, it is a, a resurrection of the old Roman Empire, but the feet are miry clay, mix iron and clay together. Um, is it kind of a resurrection of that that represents the Ten Nation Confederacy, or you got the the Babylonian worldwide government system? Those are all um, different ways of looking at systems that, at their time, rule the known civilized world at the time. So that's a big thing to keep your eye on. But people, people looked at the EU in its early days. Um, the 80s. When it was only right? eight, nine, ten, you know, countries. It's like, oh, it's ten. Well, there's 27 members of the EU now. So <laughs> if you're looking for a ten, ten country confederacy, it ain't the EU. Right. Unless a whole bunch of countries drop out. It was worthwhile to keep an eye on, but a lot of people were making proclamations, right? Which is what you don't want to do. You can keep an eye on and go, ooh, what's going on here? This could be, you know. Well, and then the nation joins up. Well, that wasn't part of the Roman Empire, so that one doesn't count. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. But like you said, the numbers increased. And you got other people bailing on the system now. and So it's going to, whatever its final form is, ultimately what will end up happening is it's going to be a global system. It's... The, the, you have juxtaposed in the book of Revelation regularly, you have those who dwell upon the earth, the earth dwellers, um, as opposed to those who are alien on the earth, and that's the tribulation saints, the believers, who um, have a completely different mindset and destiny. So, earth dwellers means everybody on, on the earth. We, Revelation 3.10 this trouble, this tribulation that happens, comes upon the whole earth. So it's there's not going to be a place to hide. The only place we can read of where you can hide that we're aware of is in the hills, probably Petra, outside of Israel, where they Jordan. The, in Jordan, where we read that um, a remnant goes to flee, and um, but God's going to feed them there. He's going to nourish them there. We read about that, and we're getting ahead of ourselves there, too. But that's kind of interesting because, you know, in this age where we have ICBMs and other forms of missiles and planes and things like that, well, somebody could fly over with a, 
couple of tomahawks in a helicopter and fire into Petra and take everybody out in short order. But God, you know, so God's going to divinely protect people there. But there's not going to be islands or anywhere else where you can you can hide. We we re read that already in Revelation chapter six, right? Where some um, important men on the earth run and hide in caves and they find themselves in the middle of the wrath of the Lamb and, and they recognize it for what it is and they're saying, calling, crying out to the rocks, fall on us for the wrath of the Lamb has come. So some of those people recognize exactly what's going on, and, but that's not going to protect them either. So 17, 4 and 5, did I read that? 17, chapter 17, 4 and 5, so you, you keep flipping forward here. Um, so the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Now this is the two beast, two um, beast systems. We have two different Babylons. One Babylonian system is more of the monetary world governmental system, and the other one is a religious system. So this is the woman that rides the beast. This is the religious system, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication, and on her forehead a name was written. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. Seems kind of crazy thing to go and get the uh, tattoo for, right? I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. And then uh, what we're not going to do tonight is go into the meaning of the, the woman and the beast. We will do that in the future, I promise. But the um, main thing is, is we see this thing going on with, it's like a competition against God with marks on the forehead. And uh, it's just kind of a strange thing. Flip ahead a couple more chapters. Chapter 20. After Christ returns, and we've... Um, we have him on the white horse, and he returns to the earth. The question comes up, well, what's going to happen to all these different people then? Because you've got some are believers, some are not believers. What happens to the Antichrist, the false prophet? What happens to Satan? Who's who? You know, what happens to mortals and immortals and stuff like that? The dead people, how, how does this all come together? In chapter 20, it answers a lot of that. And it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, lest you should question and wonder who that is, and bound him for a thousand years. Do you think thousand years means thousand there? And if it means something other than thousand, what does it mean? And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal, there's another seal, on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So there is a finish point to it, isn't it? Isn't just a broad kind of generic general time. There's a specific time frame there. So when that time, the thousand years are finished, but after these things, he must be released for a little while. And then we have... Um, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And then flip yet again a couple pages over in chapter 22, verses 3 to 5. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face. His name shall be on their foreheads. There that is again. 
there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And then he said to me in, in verse 6, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the Holy Prophet sent his angels to show his servants the things which must shortly or quickly in rapid succession take place. Behold, I'm coming quickly. I like that part. Behold, our blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Special blessing there. So, so much for marks and seals on the forehead and all that good stuff. Questions, comments about, about that? I have a question. Yes. Somewhere in here, I can't find it. It says he has a name on his thigh. Jesus has a name on his thigh. So do you think the name on their foreheads of God, Jesus, will it be the same as on his thigh? I mean, that's something you know worth, saying, worth, yeah, it's worth it's considering. Worth considering. And he says nobody knows his name. So well, his thigh, also he hands out stones to serious. each one of us too. When we go see him, he's going to have a stone for each one of us, and we're all going to have our own private name on it that he gives to us that nobody else knows. It's Revelation 19, uh, 16. Uh, is it 19? But it does. It says it's on his thigh. Mm-hmm. So I wonder King if King that's King the same name that's King of, on. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I mean, that is a name for him. So. Yeah, but that's what it says. Yes. On his robe, on his thigh, he has a name written. Mm -hmm. They're calling the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I think it's saying that that's the name. Of the I know. Well, that what I'm saying is that going to be the name that's on all the foreheads. The well. That's you know what I mean. An interesting study. Sometime and this is this is where you can get you know kind of crazy is is that god has dozens of names hundreds you know a lot and so you know king of kings lord of lords jehovah jireh adonai awesome. yahweh you know we we keep going and uh, other names that are just short phrases of things like king of kings and lord of lords phrases like that he's got a lot of names like that emmanuel we can keep going for several minutes on those, but that's a, a great study. Who knows? You know, it's going to be speculation to say, yeah, this is what it's going to be. I just thought it was interesting that, you know, the reason why I was entertaining the idea of the Yod there is that Yeshua and Yahweh begin with the smallest letter in the Greek or in the Hebrew alphabet. And, um, I think it's it's not going to vary from person to person. Whatever it is, it's going to be the same mark, but exactly what it is, it's speculation. Um, in some cases where it's the beast system, it can be a mark or the name or a number, hand or forehead. See, there's some similarities, but there are differences too. So it's kind of the Nike swoosh. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just go get the mark. Just do it. <laughs> the beast is going to be look like Michael Jordan. Yeah. LeBron James. <laughs> LeBron, yeah. I'm going to be in this line. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be up there looking down going, ooh, don't do it, don't yeah, do don't it. Don't do it. <laughs> don't get the Nike mark. I'm going to be like, watching those horror movies. They're like, let's slow down, bird. Yeah. Yeah. Take the power. Or walking out in the forest with a flashlight saying, hello, <laughs> is anyone there? Who's there? Yeah. 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 The I love that. Yeah, I'm making a sound. I am. Oh, TV, so I'll see it. Like, you stupid. I know, let's go hide behind the chainsaw. Let's go hide behind the dynamite and the plastic. I mean, really, really, though, we kind of laugh, but I mean, th this is a train wreck waiting to happen, and you know that a lot of people are going to go that way. Probably most of the world, and it's really kind of crazy. You know what's really kind of crazy, too, is is I just shut my Bible up, but the very end, a handful of verses at the very end of chapter 9, who's got that open? Read the handful of verses. 20. 
I'm 20 on, 20, 20, 20. Sure. Let's see if that works. But the rest of mankind who are not killed by these plagues do not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So by the time we get to chapter 9 and you've got all those seal judgments have happened and, uh, and uh, some of the trumpet judgments right there and woe is okay. dumping on the earth everything's starting right happening right around there beginning right around there not the bowls yet but in the middle of that you got the rest of mankind that didn't repent that doesn't mean like nobody's ever going to repent again because you've got a huge segment of Israel um, that's going to survive and repent and it's going to be a huge revival right we're going to see that especially beginning with the middle of the tribulation week or the beginning of great tribulation that's always been the promise that we were told from Romans chapter 11 is that all Israel will be saved and all doesn't mean every last individual but it means a healthy elect will be saved so I don't know if that's referring to in chapter 9 verse 20 if that's most people is what it's saying or the nations I think it's it's after a bunch of plagues in which a whole bunch of people are killed right and so they're saying so after the half the world is killed, killed by this time you know third was killed then the rest they don't repent if, yeah plagues. Yeah. so it makes you wonder well does this mean that no more since it's talking about the nations and God's judging the nations does this mean nobody else in the nations repents after the end of chapter 9 and that's kind of or it's probably I'm kind of lean toward it's probably hyperbolic language hyperbole means you exaggeration for the sake of making a point in other words just about nobody's going to repent even by that point if you haven't repented by that point like you said Larry half the world is destroyed you're you know you're, you're, you're stick a knife and you fork in you you're done yeah you still haven't repented what's going on it's you're done. I mean, I don't read of uh, the nations or any more Gentiles or whatever that are other than Israel. I don't read of salvation to the nations other than Israel after this point, certainly. Yeah. I don't read of it. So, so you know, you that's a possibility. Okay. That absolutely. Okay. Some, it's a possibility that we have to entertain and um, be part of God's judgment because it's not like well God you didn't give him a chance that's so unfair really I mean really I think the any Gentiles that are saved after the rapture you're like you're because that's the fullness of the Gentiles that's the end of the mystery of the church age well so even after, that's the whole shaking that's going on it's yeah. the whole lot of shaking going on is so get getting tension get saved in his minute. however it's, it's God's plan not mine yeah. so any saving that he does after that point is his grace it's his mercy and his grace, yeah. But, and we saw we will see his mercy and his grace too among among the nations and Israel during the millennium, yeah. because who goes into the millennium is all believers, but they're gonna have they're gonna make babies, right? Yeah. And some of them are gonna become they're gonna be unbelievers, and so um, we we find a bunch of them at the very end of the millennium rise up and go after the Messiah sitting on his throne in Jerusalem. And uh, Satan's going to be rallying them around and, and gathering forces to try to go up against Jerusalem. It's absurd. But God's mercy is he's still going to be saving people even during the kingdom period. So the two witnesses that witness, who gets saved from them? Just Jewish people? So there's not a lot said about what exactly they do other than as, as the two read. witnesses. Yeah. Um, we know that, I, I mean, they could be like Jeremiah, you know, who nobody listened to, the you know, prophets so often in the Old Testament, they're up there preaching and nobody's listening. So people are condemned, it's justified that they're condemned because, hey, I sent all these witnesses to talk to you guys and to proclaim the gospel and you still ignoring them. There's even a point in here where we're going to look at where there are going to be some angels circling up there in the atmosphere proclaiming the gospel and telling people to repent. So people have no 
no excuse at all to say, hey, I didn't have a chance. What about these poor people didn't, they never had a chance. It's so unfair. But, but we do see where, um, you know, Antichrist forces are going to go up against them and it's going to end badly for, for their forces. Satan himself will go against them and even that is by permission. Is God shows who's in charge of what by resurrecting them three and a half days later. So we'll, we'll get into that. We're real close to that. So next time what we're going to do is we're going to now we're done with this interlude. We're going to look at the seventh seal, which starts the trumpet judgments. Um, and we're going to go cruising on in, into chapter eight. One question I've always kind of had, because like, I mean, What's Satan that? knows about, uh, one question I've always had, because Satan knows about like, the Bible and Revelation and everything. Does he just not believe anything in Revelation? Because like, yeah, he, you know, he is going to do all that is written, but like, does he just not know about Revelation? Does he just think it's not going to happen? He's like, ah, I'll do all this and I, or does he just accept his fate? I've always wondered that because it seems like, is he so prideful that he actually thinks he's got a shot? Yeah. And he's trying to build a secret army somewhere, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So there's all kinds of ideas and theories about that, you know. What about the, that should be, I just lost it, uh, the place where they hide? Petra? Petra. Yeah. Why does he not go there? Because he just has to read and know that they're hiding. You mean Satan? I don't think he's got permission to because God will nourish his remnant there so he doesn't have permission. Same type of thing is the reason why a missile or ICBM would not be yeah, yeah. deep in those caves in there. It would be tough to... <laughs> yeah. Maybe well, he's not complaining. Maybe every time Satan tries to hear or see anything about Revelation it just is blurred for him. We don't know. Yeah, I think he he's know. Just so psychotic that he just thinks he knew it. Yeah. I mean, that's from the beginning. He thought I can be God, so yeah. I think well, goes, we have one phrase about we have one phrase about this when he's kicked to the earth and he's indwelling um, Antichrist who's been resurrected by permission. God allows Satan to actually go in and indwell Antichrist, and that is how he reacts in the phrases because he knows his time is short. So he knows that okay. This is the last hurrah. This is the great tribulation. This is where things are. I've got three and a half years. So then we see his scorched earth policy because it's ironic. We've got this Antichrist system on the earth during Daniel's 70th week. So it's a seven year period. And the Antichrist has built up this system and we've got this beast system, which is, you know, resurrected Rome, the two Babylonian systems, the religious system and the governmental system and economic system. And so we've got all this carefully constructed. One of the first things the dragon does when he comes up out of the sea, which means probably the people, the master people who comes up out of there, he inhabits, dwells in, possesses Antichrist, just like he did Judas at one time. First thing he does is he goes after all the saints. He goes after the tribulation saints. He goes after Israel. He sends a flood, which is uh, euphemistically from the Old Testament. A lot of times it's a flood, like an army, a mass of people after them, but they flee to Petra. God opens it. They must get close at some point because it says that God opens up the earth to swallow that army up at some point. So God protects them. So he goes in and what is the, the, uh, Antichrist now indwelt by Satan do, he's destroying everything. He starts destroying the beast system. He destroys the religious system. And it's just a scorched earth policy. He starts wrecking everything, kicking all the toys over, as I said last week, because he knows you know, he's going to lose. So he's mad because he knows he's losing his monopoly game. So he's going to flip the board over. Well, and I don't think he's any different than any other created being that's not saved. We're all evil. Yeah. I mean, we got this, you know, as in the it's days true. of Noah, so will be the coming of the... Okay, but it's not about how evil we are. We're the same evil. It's about the world judgment on each side. So we're that evil. He's a created being, we're a created being. When we transgress and we sin, we think we take that authority from Christ and we sin. 
how is he supposed to be any different in that sense? So he's doing the same thing. He just has more might and power than we do, given by God, of course. But absolute power, what? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. So he has mm-hmm. all of this that we don't have, and he thinks he has access to God. He has access to the throne. He has some dominion here on earth. He has, me, he has no I, hope of salvation, though. No, it's just, no. So in his mind, I think he's so... I mean, you have to think evil. He's been alive for we don't know how long. Evil, and evil, you know, just corrupts and corrupts and corrupts. So at some point, now he's got all of this intellect, no wisdom, but he's got all this intellect, and he's got years of evil trying to always outwit and outdo and whatever. And I think in his mind, he thinks... He's got a shot. Yeah, he's got a shot. <laughs> well... Uh, Look at the, you know, the I am, right? Yeah. The, you know, Isaiah. Or I wills, rather. Mm, yeah. I will. I will, yeah. I mean, I will ascend the yeah. most high. And, and that was way back when. That was thousands of years ago, so now how much more? Yeah. We can go into, we can go into what a lot of people would consider complete la-la land, and... We can really speculate, and there's a lot of speculation about that. People have seen different things um, down deep in caves of the earth, and they've talked about lizard people and things like this. If you know, there's this is hollow earth theory, and people have seen things and armies under there. Also, we see UFOs, we see the greys that come, uh, invade, and so forth. So you've got to ask the question: Since Satan mimics God, mocks God tries to copy everything. Has Satan tried to create life on his own? You have you have these gray aliens. Well, the dust on the moon is gray. Did he try to make his own creatures? Well, he can't bring them to life, but can he make these organisms and possess them with demons and make them look like aliens, UFOs? And so, you know, is he trying to build some weird army and he's going to try to stack the deck, you know, and, and try to do some things during... This is all way science fiction speculative type of stuff but you know you you forks but you know you got to say well some of some of that stuff it is a a form of deception whatever's going on with these aliens and stuff like this so you got to wonder how much of it's true how much of it isn't and and i say it's it's all on the table satan's going to try whatever he can so we can't scratch it all off um as crazy as some of that stuff sounds satan would probably try to do some of that well, and how is that any different than any of our world rulers that are trying to take over from Alexander the Great to whoever? Trying to live forever, playing with medical yeah, things like and... Soros and... Who's that? Wait, hold on, finish. The Windows guy. It's oh, Bill Gates? Gates. Yes. And they're willing to ruin our crops and, you know, us and whatever for their whatever agenda. So. L- listen, what, man, what man's doing, and this is without Satan and all of his knowledge and experience, man is doing some crazy things too, like building artificial bodies and things and they want they're trying to experiment with ways to holographically map your brain so that you could transfer your brain your thoughts into like a robotic creature or or an organic creature and people scientists are actually working on this crazy stuff because they want to live forever so created beings that's why i say is you get you get off and people look at you kind of weird like you know but hey they're trying to do this kind of stuff and you even elon musk seems like kind of a nice guy and he seems relatively harmless i don't know he's kind of a little bit strange crazy billionaire with too much money and time on his hands but um he comes up with some weird stuff and some weird ideas but now you throw somebody with a lot of money behind him like soros and bill gates and some of these and you find out what some of these people are trying to do and you got to say um these are just mere men who have been on the earth less than 100 years um, Satan and demons who've been around for centuries and centuries and centuries, yeah, they might be into trying to do some really crazy things, you know. Especially if you, uh, you, if you, you have the power to do so. It's like, yeah. Listen, and you listen to Chuck Missler, and I got to agree, you, look, you read Genesis 6 about the Nephilim. And Satan tried it before, married with women and, and made it and tried to create or corrupt uh the line that the Messiah would come through, try to corrupt the line to the genetics to the point where God had to flood the whole world and wipe out everybody with one big family. Um, would Satan try to try that again, except on a grander and different scale? Hey, if he did that way back in Genesis, well, you know, what would he do now? You know, you got to put it all on the table and say, this dude's crazy. And he might try just about anything. So anyway, that's 
speculative type stuff. But the main thing is, is that um, we're redeemed, we're secure in Christ, we are sealed in the Holy Spirit. So that's the shield we have now as the church. Speaking of seals, we bring it full circle. We bring it full circle now to a ways we're sealed. And so we don't have to worry about those things and be concerned about those things and worry about weird creatures coming and knocking on our door and trying to get in and do weird things and stuff like that. Like a, the door. <laughs> until, yeah. But the nets is when the fur creatures start barking. <laughs> so, um, thank God we're secure in Him. We don't have to concern ourselves with that time. What that's going to be like? It's that's going to be a whole world of crazy, literally. And um, and that's another reason to share the gospel with people that you, you know, um, you care about and you love. Mostly, though, we should be sharing the gospel because the Lord deserves more voices praising and honoring him, right? More so than just wanting to see our loved ones saved. The Lord deserves more people praising and worshiping him. And that's what we should really different way we should maybe look at things and think about things. So all right, let's close in prayer real quick. God, thank you so much that uh that time is a time that we are not going to have to concern ourselves with, as, as Paul wrote in First Thessalonians, that we about that time we have no need to be concerned because we're children of the light, children of the day, not children of darkness, as Paul wrote. And um, that time will not overcome us like a thief in the night. Lord, thank you so much for that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom, give us the words, help us to know your word better, to share the gospel with people, to tell people about Jesus. And Lord, we just want to trust all these things in your hands and not worry about our loved ones who are not saved, but place them in your sovereign hands, knowing that you're not going to lose even one of your sheep, is what Jesus said in the gospel of John. Lord, we're so thankful for that. Um, help us to be faithful and to do what we're supposed to do and sharing the word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If it's in Christ's name we thank you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.